and welcome back to another sam.gov bids live today we have episode number 48 where we walk through small business solicitations together on sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on sam.gov for your small business now today we will be reviewing up to five small business solicitations that i've pulled up on sam we'll see how many we have time to get through um, and we will be jumping into that in just a second. But if you're new here and you don't want to miss future Sam.gov Bits Live episodes, make sure you subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. So welcome everybody who is uh, an early bird here and hanging out with us live on the show. Let's go ahead and kick it off by just, and I see some of us have already started doing this, but let me know what state are you from? What state are you representing across the country? Let's turn those lights on across the country and see where our community is hanging out today. And then also, if this is your first live, if you finally made it, let me know that this is also your first live as well. And while we give it time for that to start, I'm going to go ahead and get started by showing you a sneak peek at some of the bids we're going to be covering in today's episode. The first bid we'll be responding or responding to the first bid we'll be reviewing today is the uh, yellow ribbon for Army National Guard uh, Georgia. The second bid we'll be looking at is for janitorial so services out of the Womble Ranger District, Mount Ida, Arizona. After that, we have grease hoods and duct cleaning, Wright Pat Air Force Base. We also have ranger station snow removal and then also if we have time for it we have a opportunity for retirement training classes which sounded a little different a little interesting to me which is why i pulled it as well so in just a minute we'll go ahead and get into all of those let's go ahead and touch base with all of you guys in the chat looks like we have a curly black michael johnson from kentucky in the building what's going on first uh First comment, uh, credit to you. Um, Code Knights, thanks for hanging out with us. Tyler Tatum from Georgia, what's going on? We have Dwight from the Dub K, which is Wichita, uh, Kansas, finally caught alive. Awesome, welcome, welcome. Oh, Cyrus, I see your, uh, I see your question, and I will um, circle back to that when we go through our first rounds of questions. But Demetrius out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, we've got. Stacey Holt from Kansas as well. Marie uh, Cheney out of San Antonio, Texas. What's going on? And awesome, guys. Code Knights, this is your first live. And I know we got a lot of people still jumping in here, hanging out with us. So again, let me know what state you're representing. And if this is your first live, let us know that in the chat. And then um, uh, actually, we'll just jump in and we'll go ahead and uh, get into our first bid in the meantime. Now, in case you guys don't know, and, and for those of you who this is your first um, I don't look at any of these bids ahead of time. And the reason for that is I like to go through them raw and real with you so that you can kind of go through with a safety net encountering the same thing that you're going to be doing on your own or are probably already encountering on your own, but doing it live on the channel, hopefully builds your confidence, builds your skill set to empower you to, again, when you are out on your own, to give you some kind of troubleshooting or some tips or once again, some confidence for pushing through some of the uh, stumbling blocks or some of the hurdles that you are going to come across inevitably when you're going through live solicitations on sam.gov on your own so we keep it um raw and i don't again go through any of this ahead of time for that reason and cami from atlanta georgia we got mvs strategic solutions hello hello vn out of illinois um mvs strategic solutions out of florida awesome guys good to see you all welcome welcome so our first bid, as I mentioned, is the yellow ribbon for the Army National Guard, Georgia. This bid is due November 14th. This is a small business set aside. The next code they have for this is 721110, hotels and motels. And this is out of Marietta, Georgia. Maybe some of you are familiar with that area. Just jumping off the sheet here, uh, fresh eyes looking at this. RFQ is jumping out to me. They're going to be, you know, focused on a price. We know that there's yellow ribbon. So we kind of know with yellow ribbon, 
This is going to be an event. It's going to be a day or probably an extended weekend. It's going to consist of some sort of hotel uh, and food and maybe conference room and audiovisual type components, potentially. I'm also seeing this is Unison Marketplace. So I actually try to weed these out and I didn't uh, catch it on this one. Um, but it's, it's bumping us to another website. It says the solicitation pricing on Unison Marketplace will start on this date. So you will likely be bidding on Unison, which is a third party that interfaces for uh, government solicitations through the medium of a reverse auction. And I don't really love those for you guys, which is why I don't really cover them. So what I'll do is I'm just, I'm just going to kind of pick what I can through here because there's a little bit to go through in the description and I'll, I'll share my comments, uh, but I'm not going to go over to Unison. Um, and again, the reason for that is, let me go ahead and take the banner off. The banner is fleeting. Um, the reason for that is that, let me go ahead here. Unison Marketplace, it's, as I said, it's a reverse auction and it is a third party third party intermediary that interfaces with government agencies to further post their solicitations. And it's a reverse auction, meaning it's going to be price driven, but it's race to the bottom pricing. And the reason I don't love this for new GovCon startups is because you can really get forced to get into uncomfortable margins. Um, and it also favors supplies over services. And you know that I'm the services guy, so I'm big on services. So it's another reason why we don't focus too much on Unison Marketplace bids. I'm not saying you can't, and there's certainly nothing wrong with it, but it gets you into a little bit of the, the rat wheel game where you have to bid on like dozens and dozens and dozens of contracts and lose most of them. Um, and those that you do win is going to be for smaller margins. So I'd just like to see you take that time and put it into something more substantial, maybe something that's going to be worth base and option years for services rather than a one-off um, you know, supplies type contract. And we do get questions about that. So hopefully that answers that. But just to do a quick comb through on this, we're given uh, line items are saying 80 rooms. And so let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit since we're operating off of the SAM screen still as well. Uh, 80 rooms, they're saying brand name or equal, which is kind of a irrelevant statement unless they're telling us which hotel they want. Government reserves the right to reduce the rooms. Uh, so that's line item one, line item two. And these are CLINs, but you see that they're putting LI. We don't see this very often. LI, what is LI? It's line item, but we're seeing the 001, 002 consistent with a um, contracting line item number, a CLIN structure. They're just calling it different, right? Just one of another thousand ways how things are different from bid to bid, why every bid is different. So for that CLIN two, that line item 002, they're breaking down medium rooms, uh, meeting rooms rather, audiovisual tables, food, and beverage, which is a little. If they're if they're gonna go to the extent of already breaking it down into two cleans, why not just do a couple more? Because to cram meeting rooms, audiovisual, vendor tables, and food and beverages all into one line item is a little bit misleading, or at the very least, when contracting goes to compare bid to bid, and this is unison, so they, they may not even be doing this, but contracting is not going to be able to see clearly differences in pricings for these different light items because they're all crammed into one line item because they're not different light items. So I'd like to see this broken down into maybe five, one for the meeting rooms, one for the AV, uh, food and beverage and tables can probably be grouped together and then also have a separate one for the rooms, of course, uh, like the the overnight rooms, like the actual lodging rooms, different from the meeting rooms. I think that would suffice. And that is typically what we see on other yellow ribbon or other lodging type contracts. So this one is just a little unique. But for you, it's good because it's good experience to show how things can just be a little bit different. And this way it doesn't throw you off. This way it doesn't shake your confidence, right? But at the end of the day, we're still giving contracting what they ask for. Feel free to clarify with contracting um, any questions or things that don't make sense, but you're still obligated to give them what they want in the way that they've asked for it, okay? 
So let's go ahead and check in with the chat, guys. And hello to everybody joining in the chat. So happy to have you here. Let's go ahead and take um, a few questions. I know we had some. Okay, Osiris did have us have the question first. This is my first time. Awesome. Welcome. Glad you made it. I've been doing middle manning since September. Uh, September. I'm struggling with my S's today. <laughs> Submitted seven solicitations. Lost three due to the quote being high. I don't know if that means you won four. Or my guess is the four are still undetermined. I have a question. Do you need a tax permit or a reseller certification? So assuming that these are supplies contracts, these are seven, <laughs> these S's, <laughs> there's seven su supply solicitations. There we go. I'm assuming that those are all based on supplies because I don't know what the scope of any of those are. Throw another S in there with scope. Because I don't know that, I'm assuming supplies. Now, supplies, when you come into these types of tax permit you're asking or reseller certification, a reseller certification is only going to be if you're, you know, for example, I was an authorized reseller for Cisco equipment. I would see a solicitation on Sam.gov asking for Cisco equipment, right? So it'll be a drop ship type deal, which is very often the case with supplies contracts. In order for me to get a quote for Cisco equipment, I had to be a Cisco certified reseller. So it's going to it's going to de depend on what is required to even get the quote. So it's not going to be so much that the government's going to necessarily going to be telling you, hey, you need to be an authorized reseller. It's going to be whoever you know, if it's the manufacturer or an o o OEM or you know some sort of brand name type source, they're going to require it because they already have their pool, they already have their preferred vendors, right? That are inside of their authorized reseller. So that would be the driving force for something like that. So I can't tell you straight up without any details, you do or you don't, depends for every bid. And it's not gonna be enforced by the government, it's gonna be enforced by whoever you're getting the supplies from. And then do you need a tax permit? Uh, tax permit, that's not the wording that I'm used to two so i would say no to a tax permit but if you were talking about more of like a a state sales tax because the government doesn't pay sales tax and then we can get a uh a I'm trying to think of what the exact form is but it's just it's just that the state tax exemption form i forget what the actual form is there's a national level one but there's also every state treats it differently if you go ahead and you you dig into more of the articles and the research when it comes to state sales tax and when it relates to government contracting you will see it becomes gray at the end of the day because every state treats it differently so wherever those taxes could technically be owed that's the state that you would want to be researching um but the takeaway from this is you can also reach out to contracting and ask contracting for that um, certificate as well if it's existing in that state and then you can pass that along to you know, whether it's a supplier or whatever. Um, but again, I don't even know if that's what you're asking. So I'm going to end my answer to your question with that. Now, before we go to our next bid, I believe there was a couple more. Um, Cantina Willis says, I'm curious why you don't like Unison. Um, I did comment on that already. So definitely check out my answer if you missed it. Jason says, should someone look, uh, should someone looking for their first bid focus on one or two specific types of contracts to increase their chances of success. So Jason, it's a great question. Um, I'll try to keep my answer succinct on this because I do cover it a lot. Um, the way that those, you typically succeed in the commercial space, commercial-based business, non-government, right? Is most businesses find a way to differentiate and compete. And usually that's the whole riches are in the niches thing and you boil down and you get really good at one thing instead of being a jack of all trades. Now what happens is for existing businesses specifically, but it's that mindset that even the new GovCon startups bring is they bring that same, because literally like that's what everybody says, that's what everybody preaches, and it is the way, it is the path in the commercial space. But when it comes to federal government contracting, especially when you're a new GovCon startup, but even if you have an existing established business, if you're just gonna focus on one thing and you're gonna be very specific in that one thing, it is my opinion backed by a lot of experience that that is not a very good way to get started in the space. Um, 
if you think of sam.gov, you think of all these solicitations we cover, these live bids, these are all lists of opportunities, i.e. problems that the government needs solved. So if you have a lineup out your door, if you just turned your, your small business brick and mortar store and you just turned it to open, you had your grand opening, and there's a line of people and you're going to turn away 95% of those. Um, is that what's right for a brand new business, a business that's just come, or I should say a business that's brand new to the space, whether it's existing in the commercial space or it's a new GovCon startup, is that what is right for someone who's new in the space? I don't think so, because I don't think you have any experience in the federal space, whether you're existing or whether you're a new GovCon startup and you need to learn. And just like anybody, it starts with a throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what sticks and then a dialing down over time, a polishing down over time. The problem is too many come into the GovCon space from either of these areas so they try to be super polished. They try to have all their ducks in the row. And the problem with that is they don't even have enough opportunities that are a match for the business to go after. So then they don't have any opportunity to practice. They don't have any opportunity to respond to bids, to even learn their, learn their pricing in the GovCon space or to get better at writing federal proposals. There's just not enough raw material for to work with because they're starting so polished, which means you're not really listening to your customer. Because if you're listening to your customer, the government may be buying the thing you're thinking of, but they're buying it differently or in a way different than what you're used to in the commercial space. So you need to listen better, open up, right? And then their list of problems become more of a overlap of your list of solutions. And then you have more to go after, then you have more practice, you dial in your pricing, you dial in your proposals. Now, all of a sudden, your business has either evolved or been created and built around a different type of customer. That's what needs to happen. So <laughs> to summarize for this one, because I, I love the question. I love the question. I'm super passionate about answering it. You might be able to tell. Should you focus on one or two specific types of contracts? I recommend an umbrella. So I recommend a series of complementary services. So instead of just doing one, and I always pick on notaries. So if you're just going to have, hey, we're a notary business. I want to offer notary services to the government. I recommend you expand that. For example, an umbrella of say professional services that you offer and notary is one of three, one of four, one of five, right? Maybe you author, uh, offer other forms of staffing, maybe, you know, help desk, maybe admin, maybe some of these other things in addition to notary services, because yes, there's an X code and you can go and do the USA spending advanced search and pull the data and look at all the charts and see the spending or whatever. You're actually going to see it's a blip on the radar. There's not a lot of spending, but if you have three, four or five proven concepts of things that the government is buying, and you're also offering those in the form of an umbrella where they're complementary and you can speak it in a way that makes sense or you can communicate it in a way that makes sense in a proposal or when you win one of these contracts that past performance is still going to be relevant to these other contracts because they are they are relevant in the scope relevant in the nature because again it's a like kind of services grouped under an umbrella it all works for you rather than this is randomness so that's my recommendation Couple more and we'll move on to our next bid. Chris, uh, Christina, hello. Can someone tell me how important it is for NAICS codes to match the NAICS codes on the contracts? Um, that, uh, those who are really into the, 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 well, I'll say the dotting of the I's and crossing of the T's would say, again, when it comes to NAICS codes, those who are really into the details will tell you, you do not have to have the NAICS code for the solicitation you're bidding after on your SAM.gov profile, but I would tell you differently. Technically, you don't have to have it match. Me, I've had it happen numerous times where I was about to be awarded a contract and contracting called me and said, hey, we don't see your NAICS code in the SAM.gov profile. We want you to add it. And so just to avoid any sort of uh, confusion or delays, what does it hurt to add it? And then just do like a, a quarterly um, refresher of your NAICS codes in your SAM backup profile to get out the old codes and to make sure the codes that you're using are the most relevant for the work that you're going after. Big D, what's going on? Greetings to you as well. Cool guys, let's go ahead and move on to our next bid. What do you think? So bid number two, janitorial services, Mount Ida, Arizona. This is for Department of Agriculture, Forest Services. This bid is due November 23rd. And this contract is set aside for a total small business. The NAICS code for this is the common janitorial NAICS code 561720. And again, the place of performance is Mount Ida. 
We just have one little blip here for the description and I'm seeing contractor shall clean and maintain the office, which is a little over 5,000 square feet in a work center, which is a little over, uh, let's say 1300 square feet. So 5,200 square feet and 1300 square feet, two locations, office and work center. And we're thinking a ranger district. When we see these attachments, we see a wage determination, a solicitation and a statement of work. And that's it. And in contracting, we have Diana Freeman. So we'll go ahead and dive into our first solicitation of this episode. The very first thing I look at when it comes to solicitations, I look at the page count. It really sets, it really sets a tone for how I'm going to approach going through this. And I don't do it on the lives, but I've mentioned it a few times. I actually will typically start reading backwards but I don't do that for you guys on the show because I don't want to confuse you. But I read backwards because there's a lot of good information at the end, like sections L and M, and I like to find that first, and I like to find that fast. So this is actually an IFB, an invitation to bid or invitation for bid. But what jumps out is the pricing table that we're immediately hit with, which is going to show us a lot of information. Pricing clins, pricing tables, I love them. I love finding them early too because they share a lot of information. For example, we are we can tell there's a base year, option year one and two. So we know this is a three-year contract. Boom, right off the bat. We know it's supposed to kick off at the beginning of the year and go through New Year's. So January 1st through 1230. And the same for option year one and two. We also see that it's really just, it's one line item or one clean, if you will, but they're actually giving us two rows here of pricing. So it says two cleanings per week. So they're saying 104 because there's 52 weeks in a year. So 104 cleanings per week. They want the unit price for that, which would be the per week. Uh, could be either per week or it could be per cleaning. But I think you have to go with per cleaning because they're telling you 104 is the multiplier that you would apply for the total price. But I would certainly clarify with contracting unless it's indicated somewhere else here in the contract because the 104 really makes me feel like what is the price per cleaning and then 104 cleanings is how you would fill this up. And then secondly, we have windows, blinds, light fixtures, and uh, list any listed outside areas. And that's four cleanings per year. So that's gonna be a, you know, a seasonal type thing as well. Spring, summer, fall, winter. And then just repeat. So they just, they want these two buildings. Remember, there is the, there's the office, and then there's the work area, right? 3,200 square feet, 1,300 square feet. Janitorial to include the windows, blinds, lights, and then some outside stuff. So not going to be a big contract. So they're giving us some specific tasks here, which are typically quite common with janitorial contracts, waste basket and trash cans, restrooms, floors. Um, do we see a stripping and waxing of the floors? We don't. Windows and glass, fixtures, furnitures, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. Um, so the contractor, this is actually important. Contractor will provide the following. So this is very often there's uh, very often you will find GFE, which is government furnished equipment. This is actually contractor furnished because they're saying contractor will provide, for example, hand soap, hand towels for dispensers, toilet papers, plastic trash bags. If you're assuming the government is going to provide that, that will throw your pricing off. It will actually make your price lower than what it should be. And then if you win the contract because you won on a low bid or something, and then the government says, hey, you can drop all this stuff off in the storage closet. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought you were going to provide that. Now, all of a sudden, that's going to eat away at your margin. So it's very important anytime you see government furnished or contractor furnished that you actually look for that. Um, especially for certain types of contracts like janitorial, and then you price it accordingly. 
but again, they're including like some, some more equipment, heavy duty vacuum cleaners, brooms, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to be part of your transportation. But if you don't want to move it there all the time, it's very likely that I said the government will allow you to store it on site as well. So as I had mentioned, this solicitation is 24 pages, so quite succinct. I'm going to just kind of scroll through our clauses here and see if we have any instructions at the end for our response. So we had reps and certs. Okay, so we see evaluation, and then we're seeing clues, uh, price proposal, technical capability, past performance. So we, we know that we've arrived. We know that we have found instructions. Instructions read. Must be registered SAM, number one. Number two, your response shall include a technical proposal, a price proposal, and your reps and certs. So if you're thinking building an outline, which is naturally the next step that comes after your, uh, or as you're reading through a solicitation, you're mentally building the outline, or maybe you're actually literally building an outline. We know that technical proposal and price proposal are going to be the substantial pieces of that. And maybe there will be some sub factors. So for the technical proposal, the technical proposal shall address the following past performance and technical capability. So in our outline, it would be more of the bold, you know, formatting for technical proposal and then factors or sub factors for past performance and technical capability for past performance. They're asking for a list of similar projects over the last three years to include title, dollar amount, years completed, and POC information. And then for the technical capability, they want a list of equipment and key personnel that are going to be on the contract. So you shouldn't be guessing for the technical. If you are, you're doing it wrong. Instead, you should be taking this, plugging it into an outline so that when you come to sit down to do this, you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. It literally becomes plug and chug. And then the more that you do that, the more that you respond to these, your plug and chug, some of that's already going to be pre-written that you can pull and just tweak or customize from previous solicitations. So the more you do this stuff, not only does your skill level go up, but your actual library, your company's library of proposal documentation grows. And as long as you have a, a, a process for finding that, then you're going to become a lot more efficient and effective at responding to government solicitations. For the price proposal, they want you to sign the SF-1449 form and acknowledge any amendments and include the pricing table that we looked at. So this is very straightforward. And then the reps and certs as usual. Um, so submit offers to Charles, but we had Diana Freeman in contracting here. So that's something that I've spotted as well. It says submit offers to Charles Freeman. So that is delivered in this inbox by the due date and time. So I would also clarify with contracting because it's possible that Charles Hang on a second. Charles Freeman, Diana Freeman. Charles Freeman's last name is spelled F-R-E-M-I-N. Guys, I got to have fun with this stuff sometimes. Diana's last name, Freeman, is spelled F-R-E-E-M-I-N. So what are the odds of this? I'm, I was initially pointing out that contracting's it's two different POCs where we potentially would send this to. So I was going to ask a question to contracting. but then they have the same last names, but then the last names are spelled differently. Weird. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen that before ever. What I was gonna share with you all is that it is very common for a solicitation to be put together and then whoever put that solicitation together moves on for whatever reason. And then a new specialist or a new KO takes it over. And so that's sometimes why we can, sometimes that can explain this mismatch, but it's like with the last names being the same, but spelled differently, it puts a, a fun little spin on it as well. I don't really know what to make of that, but I think it's funny. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Chat, chat. What's going on, everybody? Cami says, I signed up for Unison in August and I won my first country in September from the platform. Easy to navigate. I agree. It's it's super easy to navigate and I don't think it's a bad site. I wasn't saying that it's bad. Um, I was saying I don't recommend it 
because it's more for me, it's, it's a long term thing, you can absolutely win contracts, but you have to look at the margins that you're winning to see if it's worth your time. And if it's something that's going to be substantial for you over the year two, three years of up leveling your business in the GovCon space, right now, some want to just kind of drop ship items and supplies. And that's great. But it's very different than what I recommend and what I focus on and I teach. So I think Unison is great for people who are just wanting to drop ship supplies all day long. Um, but I think your mar you would find the margins eventually are not worth it for the time that you're spending on it, calling around like crazy, getting a lot of the prices, same thing that you do with services, but there's just a lot more of it. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's not bad. And I rarely say that things are bad. I speak to them in the approach of what I think uh, is best at a certain time or stage of a business and also like what type of that business is. But congratulations on the contract win. Nonetheless, Kami, that's amazing. And that is that is absolutely a win and a celebration um, in either direction. When you're the prime contractor, is it required that you physically take part in the service or can you completely subcontract the solicitation? Yeah, so Code Knights, that's okay. That's literally um, like the legal middleman method that you're referring to. Um, I'll go ahead and just pull the banner up. So if you want to learn more about legal middlemaning, there's a right way to do it. Or I should say, uh, yeah, there's a right way to do it. And there's an illegal way to do it. Okay. Unfortunately, there is a lot of reckless information that people just tell you just to do it. The point of the legal middleman method is to not show you um, like loopholes or ways to like skirt around the government or something like that. It's actually quite the opposite. It's the way to work with the regulations because the way these regulations were created and continue to be refined through the SBA and through the other governing agencies, there's a lot of input and there's a lot of thought that goes into it. So anything that is the way that it is, for example, simplified acquisition contracts, right? That's not a loophole. That is something that is encouraging small businesses on up to a certain dollar value, right? To be able to perform on contracts in a certain way. Okay. And for example, when you look at socioeconomic contracts that are not just small business, but they go another level, like our woman known, our 8A, our hub zone, our veteran known, that's a whole other game, right? So that's what I encourage you to learn. And that's what is the legal middleman method, because that's the training that I've put together on how to do that, if that's something that you're looking to do. So again, um, can you do it? Yes. Is there a right way and a legal way to do it? Yes. Do I recommend you learn to do it the right way? Yes. All right, cool guys. Michael B said, would you go about your, would you go about your profit on a janitorial contract? Like a percentage, like 20% or a fixed dollar amount? I think, I mean, your, your formulas, your equations should be based off of percentages because if you intend to grow your business and grow your business into larger contracts, it's absolutely going to have to be based off of percentages. So I recommend that you kind of get into the, into the, it's just the right way to do it. Like the, it's the right behavior to start doing now. Um, it's very risky to do something based on a fixed dollar amount because if something in the contract changes and that dollar amount changes, you could be put in a bad situation, but if it's based on percentage, then that can be tied to percentage of work being done. So for example, if things reduce, but then you're doing less work, right? But if it's just a fixed dollar amount and something just gets chopped off because the contract gets modified or something like that, and that was all of your profit, but then you still have to do work in some other way, um, that could put you in a very vulnerable position. So always percentages. Um, if not located in the area the contract is being performed, okay, so say two different states, where do you hire or find a manager or a POC to oversee things? That's a good question. Also, how do you show technical acceptability? Is it the same as a technical proposal? Um, for the last piece, the way you show technical acceptability 
is through how whatever way the government's asking you to show technical acceptability. It's not something that you have to pre-game or pre-plan because the way you're going to show it is through your proposal. And I can guarantee you, if you try to, um, there there are others who would say, and I did a YouTube short on this not too long ago, but there are others who would say, hey, let me see a winning contract. Like, let me see an old, can I just see an old, just give me one, because that's going to answer all my questions. It's going to solve all my problems. Um, I've never, <laughs> I've never offered a, a winning contract or, or sold a winning contract or anything like that for the reason of that is like the least thing that is in anybody's best interest who is trying to learn this, for example, um, an old winning contract used on a new bid could make you look absolutely ridiculous because every bid is different. And what was good here could be bad here. You know, good things at the wrong times equal bad things. So that gets brought up as a, a way to have to circumvent learning and uh, particularly learning how to read solicitations and extract the key information that's needed to put together something in, that's in compliance, a proposal and an outline that is compliant for the particular work that's being solicited by the government, right? So I say that to elevate your, your thinking, Demetrius, and to elevate your approach to this so that it can be even better because you're already on a good track, but I want to elevate it so that you don't worry about technical acceptability before you've even read a solicitation because you don't even know if and what that looks like because it will be different for every single bid. So instead of spending resources before the bid, take those resources, save those, and then deploy those when you're actually in the solicitation and say, okay, I'm looking for technical. Now, again, in case there's a little sliver that I missed here, um, as it versus tech uh, versus is it the same as technical proposal um it could be the same or it could be different basically everything i just said still stands and then the first part of your question when it relates to a manager or a poc so if you're doing legal middle manning you could be utilizing teaming partner employees um, but if you are wanting to find an outside person you could but if it ends up being an outside person, I recommend you just build in a little for you to go. Um, it depends. It depends on how much is needed. If it's an everyday thing, obviously that wouldn't be you. But if it's something that's just requiring like quarterly visits or something like that, I highly recommend that the owner goes and visits on the contract, visits your, your team if you have one, and then also visits with the core, with the contracting officer on the contract as well. But if it's just an on like a daily thing, like the work isn't going on without this person, then it's either going to be your teaming partners person or you're going to have to develop a relationship because I could say that you could find somebody local and that's good. But if you're wanting to have somebody jump from state to state to state and you're just finding somebody local because you don't have to pay them the per diem and it's going to make you more cost competitive, what could happen is they're going to turn into campers or some of them are going to turn into campers, which means whoever's sitting on the site is actually going to be incentivized to drag the project out, which is exactly the opposite of what you as a contractor are trying to do. You're trying to, you know, finish on, on time and under budget or maybe under time. So you, you are at odds, you're disincentivized. If you don't have a relationship with a person and you're just finding somebody who's local and you're calling around and they know nothing about you and they don't care about your best interests, and they're going to go camp the site. Um, they can stretch it out. They can do things wrong to stretch it out. Like I have this personal experience and I don't want that to happen to anybody else. So if that's, you know, answering your question, because it's, you know, it's a, it's a good question, but it requires more thought. If you're going to do that, I recommend building a relationship with a person who does have your best interest and then find a way financially that's going to still make it competitive you competitive for you to have them you know go from you know from state to state so i hope that makes sense it's cool it's this question it's getting to like the real work which is why it's a really good question um so i would just encourage you to kind of think of think through some of those things and i'm trying to share some of the real things that you could come up against which is you know cost competitiveness um 
on one side, but also on the other side, having somebody who doesn't have your best interest at heart. So cool guys, let's go ahead and take a look at our next bid. How are we doing here? Actually, before we get to our next bid, what I would like to do is those of you who have been paying attention um, or following along, we have just launched LegalMiddleMan.com. So today's episode is presented to you by LegalMiddleMan.com. It's what makes um, all of this doable and uh, continued. We have three core offering for those who are wanting to Legal Middleman since it has been brought up multiple times in the chat today. We have a book, we have an upcoming uh, class, and we also have the course that is live. Um, I recommend that you go check out the site. And if you want to receive more updates, um, just go ahead and check out you know any of these pages. But at the bottom, you can text LMM to 866-781-4862. Uh, I will be in control of those text messages. So I promise that they will never be oversaturated and only be a few texts per month. But this way, you know, in case things get lost in your email or whatnot, you can receive updates. If you're interested in the upcoming book, law, uh, book launch, uh, attending our Legal Middleman winter semester in January, or um, you can even get more information again on the course, which is live, which I highly recommend to anybody who's seriously getting into this because it comes with templates and over 40 LMM training videos and things like that. So definitely go ahead and check out legalmiddleman.com. And we just launched it. So I'm so freaking excited and there's so much more to come, but for now I'll just, I'll leave it there. All right, guys, now let's go ahead and keep things rolling. Our next bit is grease hoods and duct cleaning, right? Pat air force base. This is for the Department of the Air Force. This is due November 30th. And this is set aside for total small business. The next code is 561790. And this is out of Dayton, Ohio. And I talk a lot, uh, a lot about it in the course, the actual legal middleman course, and we'll cover it a lot in the class, uh, our upcoming January class. But for example, this Work like this is not something you would necessarily think of in the commercial space. Hoods and duct cleaning. Government buys a lot of this stuff. So as we talked earlier about like an umbrella strategy and we talked about how these stand back up solicitations are really a list of problems that the government needs solved when it comes to overlapping with your company's offer. If you're if you're developing a legal middleman offer, then that offer is going to have a lot of overlap for contracts that one have promised to do legal middlemaning with, right? There's the way that you can do it uh, compliantly, but then also the government is buying enough of it so that it is worth being a pillar in your, in your umbrella, right? And this is an example of work that the government buys a lot of, and you wouldn't necessarily think of that. And this is also something that you can find teaming partners to team with on uh, quite reasonably because there's a good amount of companies that can provide this, right? So that's why there's, you know, there's like legal middleman opportunities, I call them, but then there's other more niche specific opportunities, which is great. They're all good, but which ones fit in nicely to what your umbrella is going to be. That's, that's basically what my point is. So for the description for this one, it's saying an award, if any, will be made to this responsible offer who submits a proposal that conforms to the requirements generic statement two receives a rating of acceptable on the technical capability evaluation so this refers to um one of the questions that we just answered technical acceptability number three that submits the proposal with the lowest uh the tep the lowest total evaluated price provided that the pricing is not unbalanced And that's about it. So this is actually information we can expect to find more in the evaluation section of the solicitation if we are going to have it. All right, just scrolling down here, making our way to the solicitations. We do see update uh, site visit announcements. announcement. It says update one, October 30th, which is passed to announce a site visit. We'll be offering a site visit on the 7th, which actually is today at 8 a.m. So the site visit has already um, passed. 
but they are giving you the information ahead of time that you would have needed to submit. So if you're new to site visits, you have to submit information ahead of time to get on the base to make sure those are people that are eligible to get on the base. Um, so standard kind of business procedure that you could get used to. Um, update two, 11.1, there's an amendment for the evaluation factors. And then, so it does look like there's gonna be evaluation factors. And then update three on November 2nd, uh, answers to questions. So that actually helps us quite a bit to navigate what we're gonna expect in these documents. We have a wage termination, we have a bid schedule, we have an addendum to the evaluation factors, as they mentioned, instruction to offer. So they actually broke those out into their own separate documents, which is kind of neat. Statement of work, solicitation amendment, <laughs> synopsitation, and then uh, Q and A. Let's look at the synopsitation. I, I may show my ignorance here. I don't know if synopsitation is actually, if it's actually, <laughs> it's a combined synopsis slash, slash solicitation, back with the S's here, parentheses synopsitation hereafter. And they're just saying that so they don't have to repeat themselves. Fair enough. I pretty much said the same thing on this episode as well. Synopsitation it is. So we see the copy and paste here from the description or into the description section of the Sandback of listing page. We're hit with a pricing table where we have, looks like two line items that repeat for one, two, three, four option years. So base plus four. This is, a, this is like a really great example of what we like to see for example, legal middleman opportunities. It's services, it's base plus four. This is something you can build a book of business business with so that even on year three, the work that you did on this proposal and the base year is still paying off for you. And then do that times X number of contracts that you secure per year that are like this, then you, you build a business, a book of business that stacks. So specifically the grease hoods at the medical center Try that again. Grease, Grease Hoods Medical Center contractor shall provide all management tools, supplies, equipment, and labor to provide the cleaning. And then 002 will provide the management tools, supplies, and equipment for areas A and B. So we could get a little bit more discriminators in here to break out what is the difference between these two. They're basically saying the same thing, grease hood, duct cleaning for the med center. And then for, yeah, I guess areas A and B. So that's what the difference is. One needs 12, one needs seven. And then it's going to repeat for a base plus four. Again, this is 46 pages. This is our delivery schedule, which is nice. Delivery schedules are nice because they give you an address. Sometimes they give you the POC, which is very often the contracting officer's representative. Also with a, a phone number, sometimes we're not seeing that here. We're just seeing more of the address. Sometimes you also see the actual period of performance in there as well. But um, actually this is our deliveries. So they've broken out delivery and inspection. So this is actually the delivery but this is only showing the POP. So they basically broke it down into two charts, fair enough. And they left the POC and the address blank because it's on the inspection. So fair enough. Like I said, guys, I don't ever look at these ahead of time. <clears throat> if you guys liking the episode today, um, how about you smash the like button if you, uh, if you haven't, or especially if you're not subscribed to the channel, consider subscribing as well so you don't miss future episodes and you can bring your future questions. All right, so we're deep into, okay, reps asserts. Instructions are limited. We have the evaluation. They're telling us technical and price, somewhat helpful. But I was really hoping for instructions. 
So I'm just going to do a control find for instruction. And it is not here. That's right. Just remember they've actually broken it out separately, right? Yes, instruction offers here. And that's because this is six pages in and of itself. Okay, so offer format and organization. This is what I wanted. So we have volume one, volume two. You should mirror this in your outline and proposal. Volume one would be technical. Volume two would be price and offer documentation, according to them. And a 70-page limit and a 50-page limit. This is actually potentially bigger than what I thought it was in the response. Eight and a half by 11 margins. Um, part one technical capability proposal. Proposal shall meet the requirements in the PWS, provide documentation which supports the subfactors. Technical approach will primarily describe and demonstrate the capability to fulfill all the requirements in the statement of work. So it's all about the subfactors. Subfactor one, description. This element will evaluate the offer certifications in accordance with the terms and conditions of the contract. Sub, mm, I think that's supposed to be subfactor two. So factor one and sub factor one, uh, unless they've highlighted this, maybe they're switching this out because we did have an evaluation correction, um, but it reads as a stance, quality control plan, QCP, this element will evaluate the offer's approach for ensuring performance on the contract, of course, inspection reports and prior experience, sub factor four. So they're not calling it past performance, they're calling it sub factor four prior experience. And then part, and that's volume one. Okay, so this is different than kind of what we've seen, at least today so far. Part two, price proposal, provide a cover letter. The SF1449 form, reps and certs. And then they're gonna want you to fill out the pricing on the table. So we, we try to quickly find that so that everything we do from there on builds. And we have a number of attachments here. For example, we have a bid schedule. Very similar to the cleanse we looked at, right? So now this is not our first time seeing this because we are reading for the right thing. So we see one, two, and then the base plus four years. And they just want a unit price, right? The unit is a lot lot right so the unit price would be for one and then the total amount would be for 12. repeat so pretty straightforward math on that and if you're working with a teaming partner subcontractor that would be the math that they would be doing as well so it's going to take a sneak peek at the q a for this one and then we'll probably uh move on to our next and check questions as well guys and i highly recommend making it a best practice to always, always read every single RFI that comes through or every answer that the government gives, because this is an indication of your, your competition who's asking the questions, but then of course the answers benefit everybody. It says, when will funds be made available? Funds are earmarked for this effort will be made available once all offers are received. So they're saying that this contract is, that there's funding obligated for this through earmarks. It's not always the case. Some of you have experienced that for yourself. There's multiple locations. I write uh, Patterson Air Force Base. Um, could you please verify the address? So please see the appendix as the answer, yada, yada. So these are not necessarily groundbreaking um, questions, but always good to check them. Code says, I was literally just looking at this. Great choice. I mean, it's, it's a solid legal middleman opportunity from, from a glance and from the review that we just did. John Max has just joined. I'll need all the info to get started. Uh, absolutely. All the info um, is the best way. Sharice says, I'm new to contracting. 
if we see a request to purchase equipment, can we ask the agency to pay up front? No, we can't. We can't ask the government to uh, front the money. Um, so you would have to, if you're buying equipment, likely whoever you would be buying that from will provide you terms, right? And so then you'll just factor in the cost of money. You see what the terms are, factor in that cost of money to your price to the government. Um, that way they can provide you the upfront capital to do this because they, most of these companies, these OEMs, these resellers, whoever, they don't expect it just to be a cash deal. They have some sort of financing, et cetera. So I would start there. And then if this is really going to be like what you do, if you're really like into supplies, then you can get into some sort of like factoring sort of uh, agreement, or you can try to get SBA loans. I know some people don't love those bank loans, credit, like if you don't have the cash, um, financing is going to be kind of your next, your next step. All right, cool, cool guys. Will the LMM course have a payment plan option? Um, no, the course itself does not have a payment option, but what I have offered uh, for the course is anybody who purchases the course, they're able to roll over that investment into the class, which ultimately cuts the cost of the class basically in half if you take advantage of the early bird pricing. So that's my way of offering $1,000 off. Um, that's, that's what I have to offer for that. Um, All right, so then our final bid for the day, it looks like we did make it to it, retirement training classes. <coughs> Department of the Defense, uh, Department of the Navy. This is due November 14th, small business set aside, 541611, Administrative Management and General Management Consulting Services, NAICS code out of Philly. They intend to procure retirement training classes, retirement training classes using a small business set aside. Let's just, well, we just have one attachment. I was going to say, let's dig into them, but we will dig into it. 66 pages. SF 1449 form. Hey, I think that's one of the first times we saw one of those today. I'm curious as what is meant by this. So I'm looking for that in mind uh, in the statement of work. So they're giving us fiscal year uh, 2024, quarter one. Mm, let's see. Okay, so it's the FERS and then it's the TSP and then it's the FERS again, the TSP that almost looks like those are option years, but they're still in a base clin. I highly suspect that this is base plus option years because they're repeating. Mm. Cause now we're on to Q2, Q2, Q2. This may have just been a mistake then. No. So they got FERS Q1 base, base year. TSP financial planning Q1 base year, FERS Q1 base year. So that's a repeat TSP financial planning Q1 base year. That seems like a repeat. And then it gets to uh, Q2 FERS and the TSP. So yeah, there's something else going on here. It's just not, uh, it leaves more to be, to be figured out. Um, the pricing cleans are not entirely standing on their own. And they all appear to be in a base year. So we have some questions about option years and we also have questions about what are the different cleans still. So they're saying statement of work for the FERS and the TSP financial planning. That's great. The federal employee retirement system and the thrift saving plan. Again, retirement training classes. So instructor experience, five years. 
in FERS and a minimum of 20 years in federal benefits and retirement plans. Okay, so this sounds more like a class that government employees can take to learn and be educated about the retirement options that they have to them and things of that sort. The anticipated number of employees per session is 25. So it'll be 25 employees, federal employees per, per session. And session dates will be confirmed. So these appear to be 16 individual sessions, 16 individual classes. And the reason we're seeing them repeat is it looks like there's two classes per quarter. Makes a little bit more sense as we start to piece the puzzle together. So two classes per quarter. Uh, it's two classes per quarter per field. Because otherwise per quarter, that would only be four. But per field, there's two different fields. So then that would be eight and eight times two equals 16. And we have 16 clins. So that's what it is. Okay, we have our delivery information which does state our POP starting 11 October. This is due November 14th. So this is obviously an older solicitation. We didn't see any amendments or any updates. So they would absolutely be updating that. Again, it looks like this is in preparation for a Q1 of 2024. So it makes sense that the government has a little bit of wiggle room to get these classes uh, you know, awarded and working with a small business who can provide training for these 16 classes over next year. See how this could be a good legal middleman opportunity potentially. And although it's, there's no option years, uh, doesn't mean that they wouldn't extend or offer a, a follow on contract that includes option years depending on which way contracting wants to go with this and their small business goals, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that affect procurement's decisions on how to put that out. So we did see evaluation factors down here. So now I'm just looking for any more details, price proposal, specific requirements, price reasonableness, Just curious as to now, what is the proposal requirement? We have our reps and certs here. I'm not seeing instructions once again. And in this instance, we do not have them broken out separately. I would be really surprised if this was a price only bid. Yeah, I'm going to do a quick for instruction. Anybody who ever is wondering why I don't start out using the control find, I, I do recommend that you, you do it once you're comfortable, but it's just, there's opportunities to find other things. So instead of kind of like backtracking and going all over the place uh, for the example of the show, I kind of just like to take things top down, but yeah, like as I teach, and as we like to do for speed and uh, you know efficiency and bid no bid decision making we're looking for specific things it's like an easter egg hunt we're going in we're not reading page by page line by line so we do have this Quotes will be evaluated in order to permit efficiency and competition. Navy may utilize the following methodology. Quotes will be initially be assessed, and they're saying quotes. They're not saying proposals. Will be assessed uh, assessed for price and ranked in order lowest to highest. Navy will then evaluate technical factors and the lowest price. So, what are those technical factors? Is what I'm looking for. In the event the quote is deemed unacceptable, the next lowest price quote. Okay, so we typically know how this works. Um, again, we're looking at more of technical acceptability. We're looking at pricing when it comes to classes. It is driven often 
by uh, LPTA bids rather than best value contracts. I just double check for best value. Yeah, best value does not exist in this document either. So we tend to lean towards Yeah, and they're just saying that the contractors requested to provide enough details that will allow the government to make a determination as far as which approach will meet the best of the government's needs. See, yeah, section M for basis of award, which is what we were just taking a look at, section M. So they're not giving us an overly amount of information. So we could always ask clarifying questions to contracting. For example, you know, we also have this price proposal piece that we looked at. But for example, uh, is the government looking for resumes of who the instructor uh you know, would be because I believe, you know, we saw the five years and the, I believe, 20 years, for example, um, from the statement of work. Yeah, five years and 20 years. But I, they haven't asked for a resume. You know, you can make the assumption, but that's not how we we do government proposals. We don't make assumptions. Uh, so, yeah, it would require definitely a, a few more comb throughs for this and then submission of clarifying questions to contracting um, definitely would be the way to represent that experience. But then if we're going to make the assumption about that, what about anything else? And then that's where the, the argument becomes important. We don't want to miss anything that contracting might be needing from us um, just because it may not be clear in the proposal. So we can ask those questions to give ourselves that opportunity and maybe your competition won't be paying attention in that way. And they're just going to give contracting price only, right? Or maybe price on a resume. Whereas you may find that a staffing approach or a management approach or, you know, anything to coincide with this could make you more technically acceptable or put you over a line that's technically acceptable versus a competitor that may not get the check mark or the pass fail of giving the government confidence um, to even have the price considered and evaluated. So I think it's a great example of how every bid is different and how we pivot and use our tools and our skill sets um, and our experience for every different bid to, re to react and respond to and make the right decisions for proposals and responding or not responding as we go through each one. These are the exact types of things that you will be or should be or are going through in your business currently. Um, and so it's my goal to give you validation. It's my goal to show you uh, what right looks like and to encourage you to maybe elevate approaches and thoughts um, if it's something you haven't thought of yet. Okay, awesome guys. Top uh, five vid just joined. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Yes, we are we are back just a few weeks now, but we are definitely back. And Isaac also, is this related to the request to roll button on Sam? Request to roll button on Sam. That's just uh, it's a new uh, semi new feature that contracting applies to certain solicitations where it's a it's a security and a privacy thing. So that only contractors and those who are interested in the solicitation are going to request access to see those additional documents, right? So it's not some impossible thing to get over. You just request the role um, per the directions that they give you. But that's the reason that they do that. As you can see on the show today and many of our episodes, it's all just accessible to the public. You don't even have to be logged in to see that. And Sam, right? Certain solicitations, uh, they're putting behind a request, a role, and that's the reason for it. All right, awesome guys. So I really hope you enjoyed the show today and amazing questions. Um, again, check out legalmiddleman.com if you have not yet. If legal middlemaning is something you're interested in, we have a lot of exciting new things that just launched this week and are gonna continue to launch basically throughout the rest of the year here in 2023. Um, and feel free to uh, ask questions. And I will be doing a special video, I believe next week, um, once our class becomes open for enrollment, in case any of you are, are interested in the early bird pricing for the enrollment for that, we'll be doing kind of a, a live Q&A to answer questions. So that way everybody um, has the information that they need to essentially get prepared to make 2024 an amazing year. And if legal middlemaning and government contracting is part of your plan, um, I would certainly love to be able to be part of that with you uh, in a live class setting. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. You got some value from the questions. You got some even more value through going through the bids. 
like today's episode, subscribe to the channel so you can ask your questions live on future screams. Screams, that's more for the Halloween episode, streams. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next episode, same time, same place next week. Take care, everybody. Amazing show.